Do you need help protecting your finances as you enter retirement? David Dickens of KC Financial Advisors has got you covered. Welcome to the Cover Your Assets KC podcast. It's time for another edition of the Cover Your Assets KC podcast. Walter Sorholt alongside David Dickens, President and Wealth Advisor at KC Financial Advisors, serving you throughout the Kansas City area with an office in Overland Park. You can find us online at Cover Your Assets KC. Dot com. David, great to be with you this week. What's going on in your world? Oh, my. Early January, no snow flying. Um, I don't know. It's a beautiful sunny day in Kansas City if you like 36 and sunny. So, uh, But, the, you know, the New Year's getting started off well. I'm, I'm getting actually some really interesting responses to our uh, two-part series on New Year's resolutions, financial New Year's resolutions. And so I think in a couple of weeks I'm going to put together a... Um, a show just on listener questions that have come up about how to interpret some of those steps that I laid out in the New Year's resolutions. And I think that'll be uh, really helpful for, for a bunch of our listeners. Always love it when we can get some good uh, listener questions to create shows out of. And sounds like we've got some good ones that'll be in the hopper. So, yeah, we'll bring that and maybe some more questions up in a couple of weeks. As uh, If you want to submit a question, by the way, to be featured on that future show, we always invite your feedback. You can email David at ddickens at kcfa.com. That is ddickens at kcfa.com. Or just go to coveryourassetskc.com to get in touch with us as well. On today's show, we're going to be talking about five important retirement statistics that we think are worth understanding. Now, before you hit the pause button or even worse, the, the big X and, you know, get out of listening to this show because you're thinking, oh, numbers, statistics, not my cup of tea. Because, David, we'll be completely honest, that's why people hire you, right? They, don't, <laughs> they don't, might not want to dive into numbers and stats, and sometimes those things can go in one ear and out the other. Um, but on today's show, we're going to take a moment to understand these statistics because I think if we do... They're going to help paint a really good picture of retirement and finances in the United States. And I think if we explore these problems and some of these situations that are created by these stats, we're going to find some individual solutions for folks as well. So this should be a lot of fun. And I know you're going to make these uh, retirement statistics easy to put into context for us. That's the plan. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I've, I've built you up. You have to deliver now. <laughs> All right. I'll do my best. All right, we'll start with, uh, start with a good one here. Uh, only 17% of American workers describe themselves as very confident that they'll have enough money in retirement. Only 17%. What kind of insight does that lead you to? Well, so that's not a big surprise to me because uh, the, the number one reason I think that's the case is because the vast majority of Americans, the vast majority of, of adults don't have a real plan. That doesn't mean they haven't given retirement and given their finances some thought, but they've never reduced that to a real plan. And the, and the whole point of a plan is once you have one and you see how the numbers all fit together and, and how your retirement unfolds financially, well, that's where confidence really comes from. So the things that I think the, over the years when I've talked to people about the lack of confidence, the things that have gotten in their head are things like, well, what are healthcare costs going to be in the future? And what kind of inflation rate is going to apply to those? Because it's a lot higher than the inflation rate of the milk and the cheese and the bread you buy at the grocery store. So that is a big thing. Am I going to need uh, long-term care insurance? Am I going to have a, a major disability? Or is my spouse if I have one? And so how is that going to impact my financial future? I also have a lot of people concerned about future changes to Social Security. Now, we've done some discussions on that in the recent past on these podcasts. My view is that sometime in the next 10 years, Congress is going to have to make some difficult choices. But I don't think that is going to include reducing benefits for currently retired people. Oh, three, four, maybe 10 podcasts ago. I don't remember, but I'll bet you do, Walter. We did a show where I suggested, here are some things that likely need to happen from Congress to put Social Security back on a firm footing, just like they did back in 1983. So somebody could go back and listen to those, but, but that causes a lack of confidence when people think, they're going to mess with my Social Security, aren't they? And then the, the last thing I thought about, there are a million reasons why people might not be confident, but the, the last one is, in recent memory, in the last 20 years, we can point out two market crashes. <laughs> That's if you don't consider what happened in 2020. But if you look back to 2001, the dot-com bubble, 
and 2008, the financial crisis, those major market downturns took about five years for the market indexes to recover. The S&P, the NASDAQ took far longer than that, but the NASDAQ and the Dow, those were five-year holes. And if you're retired and you're pulling money out of your accounts, well, that can absolutely cause some stress. So I think that's why if your plan, if you have a plan and your plan includes things like that, then all of a sudden you do have a high level of confidence. It doesn't mean you're positive about your, you know, having enough money in retirement because I've, I've got some clients with a lot of money and they're still not positive. They have, you know, lingering fears, but once you have a real plan that includes what ifs or contingencies for long-term care needs or changes to your income in the future or a market crash or two, then all of a sudden you have a significantly high level of confidence that your money is going to last as long as you do. Well, that's a great point, David. And yeah, that lack of confidence, uh, that leads to a lot of problems, you know, like with anything in life, you lack confidence in something, you're not going to execute as well as you, you know, probably should. And so we need to solve that confidence problem and uh, more education, better planning can certainly get us there. You mentioned the social security episode. I think you're referring to episode 104, which was back in uh, December of 2020. Are you counting on social security? Am I, am, does that ring a bell as the uh, right one you were referring to? That does ring a bell and I can see that you have already researched it. So I'm <laughs> confident that that is the one. <laughs> I think that's the one that uh, hit on the main points that you were discussing. In, uh, and I'll the bet you're getting ready up. to say that you're going to put a link to that. You just know me to too show. well. You know me too well. We should <laughs> switch. We'll switch roles one episode, and then you can you can say all that, and I'll try and give financial advice. That'd be a fun. We'll do like a reverse day where you <laughs> okay. lob me the me the planning questions. That would be very interesting, and you get to you can steal my lines and say the uh, show notes thing. So you're exactly right. We'll link to episode 104 in the show notes of today's show. So go check that out if you want to listen to that past episode, or just on whatever app you use, scroll over to episode 104 and check that one out. All right, so that's one intriguing retirement statistic worth understanding, and we can see why it's so important to understand that one. Confidence is a very important thing. Uh, here's another one for you, David. The average 65-year-old woman, now this stat, by the way, varies depending on what source you look at, but um, I, I actually, I think, am on the lower end of this estimate. Uh, the average 65-year-old woman has a life expectancy of 20.7 more years. And the source that I pulled this from just a couple of years ago, that was only 20. So it's actually, you know, ticking up even further just in the last couple of years. Yeah, so life expectancy. When you're born, your life expectancy, if you're a male, is 76. And if you're a female, it's 81. But once you've gotten through all the bad stuff that can happen to you when you're a kid or a young adult, and, you know, the things that can happen to you in your 50s with some weird cancer thing or whatever, once you're 65 in America, if you're male, the probability is that you're going to live to 84. And a female... 86. And so that's that 20.7 years you just talked about, a female being 86. Now, all over the globe, almost every country, <laughs> women live longer than men for a variety of reasons. And you can have fun as you're listening to this in your car, uh, talking about why those are, but we're not going to cover that here. But once you're retired, the money you've put away for yourself has to last an increasing longer and longer amount of time, number of years, medicines are getting better, but treatments are getting more expensive. And so those are all things kind of looking back to the first question we talked about of very few people being really confident. Well, part of it is we're living longer and your money has to last longer. So that's absolutely true. And you, most of us, most of the people listening to this show are going to live uh, a quarter of their life in retirement. It's amazing how that has changed over the decades, and uh, it'll get longer and longer, I would imagine, uh, or at least it's going to reshape and rechange how we uh, end up thinking about and living out those final two to three decades of our lives. So very interesting to look at that one. And this leads us to kind of the next statistic, because I think good context between these two is important. 16.5% of our country's population is over that magical age of 65. And here's what's interesting about that stat is I went back a few years ago and looked at it, David. I think it was down in like the uh, 12 or 13 percent range. So you can tell as more and more baby boomers retire, how big our population is skewed to that 65 and older. 
Yeah, exactly. So 10,000 boomers a day turn 65. 10,000 a day turn 65. And that's kind of hard to wrap uh, your brain around that number, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And by the time 2030 rolls around, all the boomers will be at least 65. But it's kind of funny. Th- that all sort of ties back to Social Security and what kind of changes need to be made, too. Because Social Security and Medicare are our two biggest government funding problems today. Medicare happens to be growing faster, but both of them are problems. Part of the problem is that in 1935, when Social Security was created, you couldn't get money out of it until you were 65. But back then, life expectancy was 62. (laughs) So you weren't ever even supposed to get Social Security. And if you did, then on average, you got it for about two years. Now, full retirement age is, let's just say, 67. And if life expectancy is... 85, kind of split the difference between males and females. Well, that is a dramatically different proposition than when Congress and FDR put Social Security into place. So all three of these, frankly, all three of these first three um, uh, retirement stats are kind of weirdly intertwined together. Uh, But our population is aging, and luckily we have a really, really big generation of millennials entering the workforce, which is going to help fund all those pay-as-you-go programs that all of today's seniors are really, really counting on, especially Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. I guess we'll just have to pick up the weight and uh, move forward, huh? Us millennials just are going to have to participate and uh, bring our fair share to the table of uh, helping everybody get to and through retirement. That's all right. We'll we'll help out in that way. No problem. Well, Walter, as a, as a 62-year-old, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. We can get along, the different generations, right? (laughs) Um, So much good stuff here to unpack. A couple of more good statistics for you. This is another one, David, as we switch gears a little bit away from talking about longevity, uh, but still a little bit related to that, just in a different way. The average retiree will spend 295000 so we'll just call it about three hundred k on out-of-pocket medical expenses over the course of their retirement. Just two to three years ago, this stat was around 80000 lower. So the expectation and the estimates continue to increase for what healthcare is going to cost us. Huge numbers. Yeah, huge numbers. And the growth, I thought, was particularly interesting. But that goes to back to the confidence thing of, well, what's it going to cost me when I need it? If you're 65 today and you're going to live to 85, well, 20 years worth of inflation onto what you're spending in medical expenses And again, medical expenses don't go up at the same rate that bread and milk and gasoline do. They go up at a faster rate of inflation. The other thing I thought was interesting about that statistic was if you happen to be a married couple, well, it's 300,000 per retiree. So your plan as a married couple should probably include maybe 600 grand worth of medical related expenses over the course of your retirement. And that doesn't necessarily. Well, it doesn't include long-term care because in Kansas, Missouri, right here in the Midwest, it costs you between eighty and 100000 a year for long-term care. The average stay, statistically, once you're in long-term care, you're probably going to be there for two and a half years. Well, that's, that's almost the entirety of the 300000 So if you're going to need long-term care, your numbers just got a lot bigger, and that needs to be worked into your plan to give you the confidence that if that happens to one or both of you, if you're a, a two-person household, that you, sh- you want the confidence that we're going to be okay if that happens. My initial reaction to that is just thinking of putting myself in the shoes of somebody thinking about retiring and hearing that just a ballpark, I'm going to need a million dollars just to keep myself put together through my retirement <laughs> years and uh, you know, kind of live out the final couple of years. That doesn't sound that appealing or exciting and and why I saved up all this money my whole life, David. I mean, uh, but but at the same, and it's also overwhelming. Like maybe I've only saved a million for retirement or if I've even saved two million, you're saying half of that's going to go to that purpose. But that's where you kind of come in and get a little bit more creative in the planning process and finding different ways to, through some overlap and strategic planning to help fill some of those gaps and holes and make it so that we don't have to just take a million dollars of our savings and just let it sit on the sidelines for that one specific, you know, goal of health care or long term care, right? Exactly. Because, you know, who knows if you're gonna need it for how long you're gonna need it. And 
living your life in fear of maybe needing it, a big pot of money to do that, well, it's the fear that <laughs> will probably cause it. You just don't want to live fearfully. So for a bunch of Americans, it's going to be a big number. For some Americans, they're going to, you know, the, the, if you happen to have a spouse at home, well, that spouse is probably going to take care of you for a while. Uh, maybe for the whole time you're, you're needing care and you have somebody come in. So there are cheaper ways to do it than 80 to 100 grand a year. But your stat of basically 300 grand over the course of your retirement for medical premiums, for procedures, and for prescriptions, that's a lot of money. And so that has to be worked into your plan. That's a great point, David. And uh, it's all about the planning process and why you talk to David Dickens about what's going on in your financial life and how you can best prepare going forward. One more stat for you, David, and uh, we can, you know, this is a logical one, I think, to close on. 90% of people over 60 say a written retirement plan is important, but only 20% actually have one. Now, okay, don't go fact check me on that one. I, I kind of made up that stat, but I'm going to guess that uh, the people that you, you know, tend to meet with for the first time and start exploring and all the folks that you talk to retirement about, I'm going to guess that I'm not too far off anecdotally from your experiences of that dichotomy between saying it's important to be prepared, but then in, actual, in actuality being prepared. Yeah. So actually, the, I mean, the people that come to see me typically have money but don't have a plan, which is why they're coming to see me. If they have money and a plan, maybe they're a super good do-it-yourselfer. Maybe they've already got an advisor who they're happy with, and there's no reason to come to me. If they don't have any money and they don't have a plan, well, there's no reason to come to see me either. But for people that have done well for themselves but don't have a plan, that's one of the things that a firm like mine can really help you with again, to give you the confidence going forward that your money's going to last. Real quickly, I know we're kind of getting long in the tooth here for my 15 to 20 minute podcast, but I often get the question, well, Dave, what's in one of these plans? What does a written plan really have to have to make it a good plan? So I think the plans that we do, and so if, if I thought they needed more than this, I'd put them in, but you have to know, first of all, what are my sources of income in retirement? Well, that's pretty easy. Social Security, maybe a pension, guaranteed sources of income. Maybe you've got an annuity that's going to pay you money forever. You also need, which the vast majority of people don't have because it feels like a budgeting process, but you have to know in some detail, how much do I spend every month? And when you actually start to monitor that, you also find ways where money leaks out of your checkbook that you really didn't notice it. But you need to know how much income you're going to have. You need to know how much you spend. Hopefully the software you're using understands your taxes. They know where you live, so they know if you're paying Jeff City or, or Topeka or wherever you live, they know you're paying state taxes at a particular rate and federal taxes. It also needs to include inflation, like we talked about with healthcare, but frankly, all your stuff is gonna be more expensive, very likely, five and 10 and 20 years from now, because we tend to have some inflation. You also need realistic growth rates on your investments. If you put in that my investments are gonna grow eight or 9% a year, compounded forever, <laughs> I got bad news for you. They're not. And so you have to have some realistic growth rates in there. And then your plan should also include, it should have a place for contingencies. What about if I have accelerated medical expenses? What if my wife or husband needs long-term care for two and a half years. What if my spouse dies and that person, he or she has a pension that I'm counting on? I'm gonna lose one of our two social securities and the pension. So those are some of the things that have to be built into a really good plan. Just to leave it off where I started, I see a lot of people come through my door that have saved a lot of money for themselves, but they have no plan. Consequently, they're low on confidence as to how this retirement thing is going to work out for them. And that's one of the things, other than managing money, hopefully pretty safely for them. The other thing I do is have a, a plan that we unfold every year to make sure we're still on plan. And that's where their confidence comes from. You pretty much stitched back together all five of those statistics <laughs> to show how they work together. That's beautiful. It's like the end of a movie where it all comes back together at the end. Uh, fantastic. If you don't have a plan in place, if you're part of that, uh, uh, let's see, let me do some math, 83% of Americans who don't describe themselves as very confident 
uh, that, that you're going to have enough money in retirement or that you've got that financial plan in place, well, don't hesitate to reach out to David and talk about your situation and what can change going forward and how you can move yourself into that very confident range. 913-317-1414 is the number to call to start a conversation with David and the team. 913-317-1414. Or you can go online to CoverYourAssetsKC.com. That's CoverYourAssetsKC.com. And get in touch with us through the website as well. And get your own complete planning review. David calls it this financial CPR. You can certainly uh, have that conversation and walk through that process very easily. just takes a little bit of action on your part to get the ball rolling. David, thank you for the help on the program today. Enjoy the conversation. and We've got another good topic on the next show. We're going to be talking about the three qualities of money. A little preview for you. Some good, basic understanding of financial principles that will set up anybody, I think, for a solid retirement and financial future. This should be fun. I'm looking forward to it, Walter. All right. We thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for tuning into the show today. We'll talk to you next time on the Cover Your Assets KC Podcast. Investment advisory services offered through Brookstone Capital Management, LLC, BCM, a registered investment advisor. BCM and KC Financial Advisors are independent of each other.